right, so uh, hi everyone. Thanks for being here. Our guest today is Laszlo Nemes, who uh, teaches at Semmelweis University in Budapest, which is a, a medical university, and he uh, focuses on, focuses on, uh, on bioethics. And he is also very interested in uh, popular philosophy. And he's going to talk to us about the organism in bioethics. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. So I am a philosopher and I at the same time teach uh, uh, bioethics at the uh, medical faculty to medical students. So it is a somewhat different uh, area. Um, but I used to be interested in philosophy of biology uh, since the middle of the 1990s. And uh, at the same time, I try to connect this area to bioethics in the hope that uh, by doing this, I can make uh, bioethics more substantial. So actually both of these areas, uh, these two areas can learn certain important things from each other. So uh, my uh, choice today was to talk about some bioethical topics. So this is a presentation, and uh, this is the uh, title of uh, the whole title of my uh, presentation today: "The Organism in Bioethics: Scientific and Philosophical Considerations." Okay, the first question is: What is an organism? What can we uh, uh, say about the organism? Uh, this special category, and uh, uh, what uh, do we know about this uh, from uh, philosophy of science or biology and uh, theoretical biology and uh, philosophy of biology? The first uh, thing is that it is uh, still an elusive term. It is a very elusive term with uh, with uh, some complexities uh, and difficulties to define this define it uh, uh, precisely. And uh, I can add that even more than ever, so it is much more uh, complicated uh, because uh, of uh, some new, uh, uh, so insights about uh, the nature of uh, biological uh, processes or uh, new technologies uh, to detect uh, the subtleties of the living world. And uh, this term is uh, at the same time part of our vernacular language. We have uh, all, we have a, a, a by and large firm um, uh, a basis to think about uh, the organism. We have uh, uh, certain uh, uh, conceptual intuitions about this and psychological uh, capacities uh, to make distinctions between um, 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 living and non-living uh, uh, things um, from early childhood. So this can be a good starting point to see this uh, uh, intuitive uh, conception about uh, organism and how we use this in our vernacular language. But at the same time, it is a theoretical term, so we have to uh, rely on this uh, 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 terminology when we uh, analyze uh, those bioethical questions, topics uh, within which uh, the term by organism uh, plays a crucial role. And uh, the organism has a notable history in philosophy. And the most uh, important figure in this regard is Immanuel Kant. But some other philosophers before Kant, for example, uh, Leibniz, and after him, uh, Hegel, and other philosophers uh, contributed uh, to the conceptual uh, clarification of uh, uh, this uh, uh, natural phenomenon. And uh, so I can conclude that uh, the term organism is not an innocent one. So we have to use this term uh, very carefully in bioethics and in uh, philosophy of science, philosophy of biology, uh, to be more precise. Present uh, in many bioethical topics, discussions, uh, in the first part of my uh, presentation, I will offer a general introduction to the term of uh, bioethics, uh, of, uh, of the term uh, organism and uh, related uh, uh, biological knowledge. Uh, and then in the other part of the uh, presentations, I will provide you with a, a list of uh, selected bioethical topics uh, 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 which uh, um, use the term organism in an essential way. And there is an unclear status of organism in evolutionary biology and uh, philosophy of biology. But at the same time, 
and this can be a good news for us. Uh, there is uh, seemingly a revival of the interest in it, and uh, there are some teleological elements of, uh, of our current usage of uh, organism as such. The question is still that do organisms exist? Back in 1989, Michael Ruse, the uh, uh, famous uh, uh, philosopher of biology, asked this question in a short article. And uh, this was very, um, you know, um, 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 typical in this, this period that the organism uh, was not uh, really present in uh, the philosophy of uh, uh, biology. This role and uh, and uh, uh, and um, the importance was uh, rather done played by the leading uh, uh, figures of uh, uh, evolutionary uh, biology and uh, philosophers of uh, biology. And uh, do organism exist? This was the paper I referred to um, from 1989. Michael Ruse wrote this paper uh, uh, reflecting on certain uh, progresses uh, in uh, philosophy of uh, uh, biology and the theoretical evolutionary biology that time. Do organisms exist? The first uh, uh, sentence obviously in one sense they do cows and horses, oak trees and cabbages, slime works and viruses, even viruses, and us homo sapiens. So this seems to be very clear, but at the same time there are some complexities and some difficulties to uh, to come to terms with this idea and this uh, term uh, in, um, in, in the real biological uh, uh, event. So there are these uh, questions that um, are these uh, uh, terms synonyms or not organism? Uh, we can talk about organism as a, something which can be uh, uh, equated with the uh, uh, living entity. Uh, so for example, uh, a living being should be an organism or not. Um, it is a question if there can be living beings, living entities, living things, which are at the same time not organisms. Uh, and um, but at the same time, it is another question that uh, every organism are uh, living or not. We can use this term rather uh, metaphorically uh, to other structures, other uh, uh, mechanisms, other, let's say, organizations uh, in our social life, for example. Uh, and uh, the third term here, which can be relevant, the biological individual or individuality. Uh, the question is that uh, uh, seemingly every organism is, uh, should be an individual biologic, in a biological sense. But maybe not necessarily, but an organism is uh, always an individual. This is a very uh, characteristic feature of uh, being an organism that it should be at the same time in the individual. But as I uh, referred back to the debates in uh, philosophy of uh, biology about the proper nature of biological species since the 1940s, uh, 1970s, sorry, 1970s, when Michael T. Giselin and David L. Hall uh, uh, introduced a new approach to a metaphysical approach to the uh, question of uh, uh, biological species, saying that it would be much better and more uh, pragmatically appropriate to, uh, to regard biological species as individuals, historical entities, and not uh, natural kind terms. So this was my uh, first uh, uh, part and this introduction to the, the, the uh, uh, term itself. The question, um, it is about the, uh, some uh, difficulties with these relationships between these two, between these three uh, terms and three uh, characteristics. The, uh, it is a, a, a quotation from a relatively new paper which tried to uh, clarify the uh, status of viruses, that is, that uh, viruses are alive or not. This is an old question and still, still unsolved, uh, say, question or mystery of nature. The question whether or not viruses are uh, alive, uh, right, uh, uh, the author of Kudin and Starokadonsky appears to be effectively meaningless because the positive or negative answer fully depends on the definition of life or the state of being alive and any such definition is bound to be arbitrary. 
So I think that this uh, seems to be strange, uh, but I think that this can apply to other uh, related categories such as object or individual or organism uh, itself too. Um, so there is this diagram here, and we can uh, imagine certain things uh, at the borders, borderline cases, or, or marginal situations where, for example, we can talk about an organism which is not individual or not even living, uh, and uh, living things which are uh, 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 not organisms, uh, and uh, individuals, uh, biological individuals, for example, these uh, uh, category, the species, uh which at the same time are not or shouldn't be uh, uh necessarily regarded as as a living entity so species is not a species can be uh individual in the biological sense but not an organism and not a living entity at the same time so uh this story is going back to uh the publication partly going back to the publication of uh, this famous book uh, uh of from uh, Richard Dawkins the selfish gene published in 1976 and there are these uh memorable uh sentences uh at the beginning of this uh, book we are survival machines robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes but they swarm in huge colonies, safe inside gigantic uh, lumbering robots, sealing off from the outside world, communicating with it by torches, indirect routes, manipulating it by remote control. They are in you and in me. They created us, body and mind, and their preservation is the ultimate rationally for our existence. They have come a long way, those replicators. Now they go by the names of genes, and we are their survival machines. I mean, or Dawkins uh, uh, means that we, the organisms, are their survival machines. So this book and the related theory is not about uh, organism. Actually, uh, giving uh, giving no room at all, or, or very small room for uh, this uh, uh, category organism. Uh, there is this uh, distinction, uh, well known, um, uh, uh, distinction between replicator and the uh, vehicle, the replicator is the gene, the vehicle can be uh, an organism, for example, and uh, or another version, which is uh, widely used in, uh, in the philosophy of uh, biology, uh, uh, coming from uh, the uh, Hall's terminology, replicator versus interactor, which attributes a more, um, the, the, um, this uh, later uh, term, interactor, uh, uh, attribute, uh, a more active role in the vehicle or this organism uh, in the evolutionary uh, process and interactions with the environment. And uh, to conclude this point, that is how uh, the concept of organism get downplayed in uh, evolutionary biology, uh, D.M. Walsh uh, summarizes uh, this uh, in his uh, two. 2015 books, Organisms, Agency, and Evolution, in the following way. Uh, the core of modern biology is the theory of evolution it, and the core of philosophy of biology, uh, I uh, add to it. Uh, it ranks among the most powerful well corroborated scientific theories ever devised. Its objective inter alia is to explain the fit, function, and diversity of organisms. Yet the category organism has very little role to play in evolutionary theory. Nowadays, evolutionary theory principally deals in the dynamics of separate organismal assemblages, populations, or suborganismal, mainly suborganismal entities, that is the genes. The distinctive properties that make organisms organisms play virtually no role, no part in the explanation of evolutionary phenomena, or at least that version of evolutionary theory that has grown to such prominence throughout the 20th century. So this is the, uh, the situation uh, even today in, uh, uh, in evolutionary uh, biology, uh, theoretical biology, and uh, philosophy of biology. We, uh, we rarely uh, refer to organism as a central uh, central uh, characters in the evolutionary process, but at the same time, we will see uh, uh, soon there can be uh, 
seen some um, some revival or, or return of this uh, term in, in um, um, biology. Um, the next uh, uh, next source will be a very interesting and good and important paper. It can be a very nice starting point uh, to uh, to uh, to understand uh, uh, the role and nature of the organism. As by Catherine Wilson, uh, the concept of the organism in the philosophy of biology, uh, which was published in the Italian uh, journal called Verifica in 2014. Uh, good paper uh, again. Um, Wilson refers to some biological anomalies, which uh, make uh, uh, the definition, the correct definition of. Uh, um, uh, organism as a natural category uh, very uh, difficult. These uh, biological anomalies are so. For example, the bee colony can the bee colony uh, regarded as a as an organism uh, in itself, or the individual bees uh, are the organisms uh, as part of this colony. Uh, the aspens in the world of plants or the common strawberries and violets spreading by runners and the dandelions, uh, the members of a single clone, um, the symbiosis, uh, different, uh, the members of different species living in, in, in symbiosis uh, uh, ask certain uh, uh, similar questions, or the mitochondria as part of the, the cell, uh, but at the same time with, uh, with, uh, with different uh, uh, gene uh, um, pool. And the larva, for example, the, it is the different uh, developmental stages of the insects. Uh, as um, um, Wilson claims, the caterpillar butterfly effectively dies twice, which uh, uh, questions uh, the, um, the status uh, of the developing uh, insect as an organism in the, in the individualistic sense. And the other uh, example can be the mollusk shell, that is uh, other elements, how can we draw the boundaries of a biological uh, organism or animal built structures such as burrows, doors, hives, monts, caddisfly houses. So the niche construction conception, which was very fashionable in the, in the say, late 1990s or the uh, uh, 2000s, uh, um, um, uh, can be a relevant uh, uh, theoretical approach to these kind of questions. So the niche is a developmental uh, system in some sense, and uh, and this uh, uh, um, so undermine these uh, common uh, concepts of uh, uh, organism as a as a well uh, clear cut uh, biological individual. So the gut bacteria in our bodies can raise other questions about uh, these. Are these bacteria part of our organism or not? So there are different answers to these uh, basic and important questions for the fetal, fetal cells um, and the intra-organismal genetic heterogeneity can uh, be another example of this kind of, uh, uh, of difficulties uh, in uh, um, defining the organism. And the last point, the last example uh, is the natural and artificial implants uh, in uh, in a body. And uh, the question is that, um, so for example, an, an, an implanted and transplanted uh, transplanted uh, um, kidney, for example, should be regarded as part of the organism uh, or, or or not, or an artificial implant. Um, so made of uh, metal, for example, uh, can raise uh, uh, the same question. And uh, Julian Huxley in 1912 uh, suggested some uh, characteristics uh, to, uh, to analyze uh, an organism and to define uh, it. Uh, and the first one, the individual organism is bored off from the environment. This separatedness is a, is a central characteristic uh, still in uh, the definitions of organism. An individual organism has a complete set of the same genes in every cell in its body. Uh, the third one is that the immunologically self recognizing, self accepting, and other rejecting. So we can turn back to the question of, uh, say, the, the fetal uh, uh, developing in the or, uh, maternal organism or these transplantations, uh, which are immunologically uh, partly different, um, at least. Uh, the fourth uh, point is uh, it is a behavioral unit with uh, CNS, uh, central nervous system, and coordinate limbs, 
that takes decisions as a unit. So there is this functional uh, approach to the definition uh, in this case. Uh, I think that uh, this cannot be uh, cannot be enough uh, for us to uh, to precisely uh, to see the boundaries of the organisms uh, and the environments, for example, or to just to uh, to to define this term, uh, stipulate uh, how to use this in uh, in uh, in science and the uh, philosophy of science. Three essential characteristics of the organisms. Um, um, Catherine Wilson uh, mentioned these three points. Uh, the third one is uh, the self-preservation. It is the capacity to self-preserve uh, 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 the functioning and even the reproduction uh, is uh, belonging uh, uh, to here. The autonomy, autonomy of this uh, uh, system, working system and the separateness uh, from, the, um, from the environment. The concept of organism, another point in philosophy. Uh, Wilson uh, points out that uh, organism, uh, so sorry, uh, the organism as uh, in, in this sense, that is the organism which refers to uh, some biological individual can be the product of a particular cultural and social or historical uh, so, so, so context that is uh, in the, the 19th century, the Western world, uh, became especially individualistic. So we, uh, we, we emphasize uh, 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 simultaneously the importance of organism in natural processes in, uh, in evolution, for example. Uh, so there is this historical, social and cultural embeddedness of the term itself, individualism and, um, and, uh, and organism as two related terms and biological contingency, the other factor that we uh, human beings are seemingly uh, organisms uh, in this uh, relatively clear sense. The integrated and well defined itself, underwrote and continues to underwrite a set of ethical stances and social movements from the right individualism and self ownership to human rights to anti vaccination campaigns to anti feminism to vegetarianism. Moral integrity and entitlement are seen as closely related to physical inviolability. The biologists are accordingly right to imply that we human beings possess an exaggerated view of the unity and integrity of the self that is derived by way of idealization from the practices of the care of the self typical of our phenotype. So I think that um, uh, this um, uh, adds certain elements of uh, the very uh, very complex nature of this term uh, itself, uh, organism, and um, we have to be aware of uh, uh, of, uh, of this complexity. And um, uh, other uh, citation from uh, Wilson's article: the notion of the organism does reflect to some degree of to some degree, an illusion, an illusion, a very, very strong word here. We hold about ourselves and about the rest of nature to the extent that we regard it as a collection of discrete and sufficient individuals, ignoring the plenitude of life forms that do not resemble us, as well as the finer details of our own constitutions and surroundings. So this is a, a bias of human human uh, thinking to emphasize uh, the category of uh, organisms as a crucial uh, uh, a player in natural uh, uh, processes. So we have conceptual intuitions, very important. Uh, so we, uh, we of course uh, have um, 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 a conceptual intuition about about the organism, living beings and, and individuals and so on. But at the same time, uh, it is equally important to refer to the phenomenology, um, which uh, uh, connected to, uh, to our, um, our interpretation of the world and use this category organism. This can be important because it is not just about a scientific and uh, theoretical term, but we have a phenomenology. We can um, be in, 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 uh, sensitive to, uh, to, for example, the beginning or the uh, end of life uh, when we try to decide if a given uh, human uh, being or a person is already dead or, or still alive in the case of end of life diseases in bioethics 
or in the case of uh, transplantation, right? Or uh, when we want to, uh, to, uh, to develop uh, uh, an intimate relationship to uh, the uh, fetuses, um, this phenomenology will uh, work uh, equally well in this regard. So phenomenology can be part of this. When we uh, approach this uh, question of uh, organism uh, from a philosophical uh, point of view, we should, uh, we should uh, use other philosophical uh, methods or traditions. Uh, for example, phenomenology can be uh, uh, an interesting uh, example of this. And uh, what about this revival I already mentioned? I will refer to uh, Dennis uh, uh, Walsh's uh, paper. Um, this one uh, from 2006, Organisms as a Natural Purposes, the Contemporary Evolutionary Perspective. Again, Walsh uh, points out that uh, in modern biology and philosophy of biology, we uh, uh, under uh, play or downplay the role of, uh, of uh, uh, genes, uh, uh, sorry, or, or um, um, organisms, individual organisms. Uh, we emphasize the roles of uh, uh, suborganismal um, entities such as the genes or superorganismal entities such as the uh, population uh, instead that mainly genes. The genes and prism played an important role uh, with uh, Dawkins or without or outside this uh, Dawkinsian uh, paradigm uh, equally. Uh, so uh, he at the same time, Walsh, uh, urged us to go back to, uh, 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 to, to, some, to get some help from Kant's, Kant, Immanuel Kant's work and uh, uh, his theories. My objective here, uh, continues uh, Walsh, is to draw to the attention of contemporary biology and um, and uh, philosophy of biology, the relevance of Kant's, Kant's relevance today in, um, in, in, uh, in philosophy of biology can be an interesting thing uh, in relation to uh, organism, the very concept of organism. The Kant's conception of organisms as natural purposes, Kant's problematic may have been largely forgotten by contemporary biology, but it has strong resonances with issues that are only now beginning to attract biologists' attention, self-organization, self-organization, and um, the emergent properties of organism, their adaptability, their capacity to regulate, their component parts and processes. So um, what about Kant? According to Kant, organisms are these natural purposes. And there is a citation from the critic of the power of judgment from 1793. Uh, organized beings are thus the only ones in nature which must nevertheless be thought uh, of as possibly only as ends and which does first provide the objective reality for the concept of an end that is not a practical end, but an end of nature and thereby provide natural science with the basis for a teleology. Contemporary evolutionary biology is a science of suborganismal entities, that is the replicators genes, if you like. I argue that recent advances in developmental biology demonstrate the inadequacy of some organismal mechanism. So this is this revival I and uh, Walsh uh, uh, emphasize the category of the organism construed as a natural purpose should play an ineliminable role in explaining ontogenetic development and adaptive evolution. And the other philosophers, I already mentioned some of them uh, played important roles in, uh, in clarifying the term uh, uh, or, or inventing the uh, term organism. Hegel, for example, uh, Helmut Plessner or Hans Jonas in this uh, article. Uh, again, there is a reference to the re revival of the concept of self-organization. Maturin and Varela names are here and uh, the importance of Kant's legacy for biological autonomy is also mentioned in a recent book by Moreno and Mosio. Kant was the first author, author uh, who defended the view that organisms are deeply different from machines because their parts and activities are non-separable and the functions of these parts are not externally imposed, but rather intrinsically determined. The revival of interest, again, on the very topic of organisms and self-organization as developed by Kant is 
furthermore not limited to system theories, uh, but also found a suitable uh, place in the wake uh, of developmental biology and system biology and so on. Um, there's a reference uh, uh, to Dennis Walsh uh, work uh, too. So the second part of that, I will uh, turn my attention to these uh, promised uh, relevant uh, bioethical topics uh, uh, within which uh, the concept of organism seems uh, to play a crucial and essential or at least relevant uh, role. The first one will be uh, some environmental issues. For example, the question is planet Earth, as in the Gaia hypothesis, well known hypothesis of, uh, of uh, James Lovelock, uh, a kind of organism? This can be a question. The second one is uh, the moral status of certain semi living entities, a relatively new topic in bioethics. I will refer to such things as, uh, for example, the in vitro meat question, um, the moral status of this, uh, uh, this laboratory um, um, uh, created uh, um, semi-living entities, organisms or are, are, are not. Uh, the end of life bioethics, a very, very important topic, of course, a large one, conceptions of uh, death, different conceptions and how can we uh, evaluate them, the brain death. Uh, conception, uh, of course, uh, uh, will be the, the forefront of this uh, uh, consideration. And the fourth one is uh, the beginning of human life. Again, uh, large and, uh, and and of course, an old uh, topic in uh, um, uh, bioethics or medical ethics, uh, uh, for example, in the forms of um, questions about uh, in, uh, abortion or the moral status of uh, the developing human uh, being, an embryo, for example, or a fetus, or a newborn baby, even, or a, or a, a, a pre -ammy. So first, environmental issues. Uh, I mean that uh, we can raise this question from this perspective, that is the biological and moral status of, first, the planet Earth, we already seen some example for this, the kind of hypothesis and uh, ecosystems, say some, some coordinated and uh, self-regulating uh, systems in the nature or species. I already mentioned this problem. Can a species be uh, regarded as an uh, organism or what can be the uh, proper moral status of a particular species, for example, a rare bird uh, species as such, not, not uh, the individual members of uh, these species. And groups or super organisms, uh, we already uh, uh, touched the uh, anomaly raised by the bee colony example. Uh, bee colony can be seen as a super organism, uh, an organism in some sense in itself or, or, or the, uh, so the uh, collection of uh, individual organism. Okay, uh, there's this uh, uh, hypothesis. The earth is more than just a home. It's a living system and we uh, are part of it. This was, you can remember a uh, very popular conception or theory or something uh, with some uh, ethical uh, relevance, that is to how to protect uh, our uh, living environment, the whole uh, planet. Um, but, and yes, of course, Lovelock uh, uh, got some support from other scientists, mainly uh, Lynn Margulis, for example. But uh, I think that uh, among scientists and among philosophers of, uh, um, biology and uh, ethicist, uh, this uh, theory uh, couldn't gain um, a large acceptance, uh, to say the least. Uh, but at the same time, it is important uh, for us to, to, to consider this possibility to, uh, to define uh, a large ecosystem, the whole planet uh, itself, even as an organism, a living organism, even in a, in a metaphorical sense. Uh, I quote some uh, sentences from Lovelock uh, himself. I reanimated the view that we were standing on a superorganism. Again, superorganism. Uh, he called uh, uh, 
planet Earth as a superorganism in this modern sense, rather than just a ball of rock. It is model uh, the competitive graph of light and dark colored plants on the imaginary planet are shown to keep the planetary climate constant and comfortably this, this south organization uh, here in the face of um, a large change in heat output of the planet star. This model is powerfully homeostatic and can resist large perturbations, not only of solar output, but also of plant population. It behaves like a living organism, but no foresight or planning is needed for its operation. So the question is that why not uh, uh, calling uh, or taking um, um, uh, this planet as an, as an organism uh, based on our current knowledge about, uh, about so biological characteristics of uh, uh, particular organism. It, uh, up, this approach is uh, often referred to as a holistic approach, but uh, when we analyze this uh, carefully, we can see that, so it is not, not a holistic one, it is an individualistic one, because uh, uh, Lovelock's uh, uh, claim is that uh, uh, the planet is an individual organism or a super organism that is an individual and not a holistic uh, structure in the original sense. And um, the further point, uh, I refer to uh, these uh, uh, problems, for example, the tissue culture and art projects, uh, uh, for example, this can be very fashionable uh, today uh, among uh, bio artists, so-called bio artists and bio designers to design uh, this kind of semi-living uh, structures, such as uh, this, uh, uh, this, this meat or, or, or artificial meat. Uh, this is a, um, um, a project, this uh, a picture, an uh, example from the project called this embedded uh, cuisine. Um, um, of the so-called tissue culture and art project. And uh, the same project uh, uh, created this uh, famous uh, thing, is a victimless, it's called victimless ladder. It's a very small artificial jacket, which is a living, living one. And there's a description here. Victimless ladder, which was, exp uh, uh, posed by many uh, expositions uh, from 2004 from the Wikipedia. The victim is a prototype of stitchless jacket grown from cell cultures and into a layer of tissue supported by a coat shaped polymer layer. This is a sub project of the tissue culture and the art project, uh, which is um, um, working at the Australian, the University of Western Australia. This is a laboratory based artistic uh, project uh, with the aim of, um, of uh, provocating, to provoke uh, thoughts uh, about, uh, about the ethics of, uh, of uh, developing this kind of semi-living uh, semi uh, uh, tissues or, or other things, um, meat or this small uh, jacket. And even there are some uh, conceptual contribution uh, to these uh, uh, bioethical questions by these, uh, these uh, designers or uh, artists, uh, Yunet Tsur and Oran Katz, the main, two uh, main figures in this area, uh, relatively new fields of uh, art. Um, say, for example, they analyze these uh, bioethical questions in this uh, paper called, are the semi-living, semi-good or semi-evil? The point is that uh, is, uh, uh, the art can be uh, bioethics or can contribute to bioethics or artistic uh, uh, performance can be part of uh, uh, bioethics, uh, uh, turning uh, the attention of the audience, the large uh, community or the society to this kind of uh, uh, urging uh, uh, problems of the near future. And another example can be Henrietta Lacks um, um, tissues or cells, the so-called uh, immortal cells. The famous book uh, uh, by Rebecca Sklut uh, uh, is available in Hungarian uh, uh, translation too. Uh, the uh, immortal life of uh, Henrietta Lacks. You know that uh, uh, there's a description again here. Lacks, uh, Henrietta Lacks was an impoverished black woman who died on, um, in 1951 of cervical cancer. And, um, and her uh, tissues and cells uh, were kept alive 
in, in, in some sense uh, to, to study scientifically. And another uh, related question can be uh, the moral status or the biological or this metaphysical status of, uh, of uh, human made uh, very complicated and uh, human like Robert, such as uh, Sophia here, who got some kinds of uh, um, uh, human rights a couple of years ago. And this will be the question that can be regarded these, these, uh, these uh, creations, uh, creatures, these creatures as organisms or, or not, even in the future, more sophisticated uh, versions of this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this artificial or even this semi-living uh, uh, robots. The next point will be about the end of life questions. And uh, I first refer to Stephen Lorry's uh, the Belgian uh, neuroscientist uh, article or approach in general uh, from 2005, when there were many debates about uh, about the uh, moral status and um, and uh, the related uh, the medical status of. Uh, uh, patients uh, in a vegetative state. You can remember the uh, very famous uh, 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 saga or this uh, case and the tragic death of Terry Schiavo that year. And this prompted the reaction of uh, bioethicists, uh, neuroscientists and, and philosophers alike uh, that uh, time. Um, there is a timeline here uh, from this paper, and you can see some um, some um, milestones here. For example, 1967, for example, the first uh, successful uh, heart transplant uh, made by uh, uh, Christian Barnard. Next year, the um, the decision. Uh, the clarification of this situation and the brain, the developing the brain death uh, uh, conception by the Harvard uh, Medical School ad hoc committee in uh, 1968, or you can see some other uh, uh, important uh, events in 1994, for example, the U.S. Marty Society Task Force on Persistent Vegetative State defined criteria for irreversibility and coined a new term permanent vegetative state. So vegetative state is, a, is an important uh, 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 point here because this not just uh, uh, helped the development of this field, but there are many uh, misunderstanding and, and, um, and um, uh, some uh, troubles about uh, uh, the correct use of uh, usage of uh, uh, the term uh, death or brain death because many people or, or the media uh, many times uh, refer to uh, people in the vegetative state as brain dead uh, persons. But this is, of course, a misleading category. Brain dead uh, means quite other things. It is about, uh, about the functioning of the, of the brain and uh, its role to maintain the biological functioning of the organism as such. So there is a quite quotation from the uh, article here. Brain death equals human death says Loris. Brain death means human death determined by neurological criteria. It is an unfortunate term, I agree, as it misleadingly suggests that there are two types of death, brain death and regular death. There is however, only one type of death which can be measured in two different ways by cardiorespiratory, that is the traditional, or new neurological criteria. This misapprehension might explain much of the public and professional confusion about brain death. The concept of death, according to this approach, at present the most accepted definition, and this is my, uh, my point here, and the sense of the definition of uh, brain death, the, the widely accepted uh, version of it, the whole brain death, that the death is the permanent cessation of the critical functions of the organism as a whole. The organism as a whole is an old concept in theoretical biology that refers to its unity and functional integrity, not to the simple sum of its parts, and encompasses the concept of an organism's critical system. Critical functions are those without which the organism as a whole cannot function. Control of respiration and circulation, neuroendocrine endocrine and homeostatic regulation and consciousness. That is defined by uh, the irreversible loss of all these functions. The tiresome debate about whether this loss is a process or an event is seemingly insolvable. Um, 
I want to turn your attention to one important point that it is about uh, the human death. But there are, of course, many organisms, many life forms without a brain or without the central nervous system, which at the same time can be um, uh, regarded without any problem as uh, organisms. So, for example, plants are organisms, but uh, without uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of central uh, uh, regulation. Uh, plants have homeostatic uh, regulation without uh, uh, brain. So, uh, in this case, uh, the, um, the animal life can be seen as a special, and especially uh, in this case, the human life and the end of it. Um, another example from a recent article uh, written by Melissa Moscala, the human organism is a very, very nice uh, uh, it's a metaphor widely used. It's not a conductorless orchestra. So it is a, uh, we often um, uh, liken the brain dead body as a conductorless orchestra and a, and a living organism as a symphonic orchestra, um, well organized and self organized uh, uh, set of uh, mechanisms. So the defense of brain death as true biological death. In this paper, who uh, she, uh, she claims that uh, about the ontological claims, ontological accounts of organismal unity. The key question is in the brain death debate is not whether life can continue after brain death. Uh, it is evident, it is evident, uh, so I would be much more uh, skeptical about this uh, uh, strong statement that it, uh, does continue after brain death in many of the body cells, organs, and tissues. Rather, the key question is whether or not those living cells, organs, and tissues constitute a single human organism as opposed to a collection of parts working together in a coordinated manner in such a way as to allow for the continued survival of all. Organismal unity requires more than just the coordinated functioning of parts in the service of a larger whole. Consider, for example, the case of termites and the protozoans that live in their intestines, enabling them to digest uh, their food, and so on. So the point here is that when we are talking about uh, the end of human life, which seems to be rather rather a clear, clear category, uh, we have to refer back to these uh, biological anomalies. So, for example, the termites and the protozoans uh, that live uh, in your intestine, and so on. This, uh, this uh, uh, perspective can make it even more difficult to, uh, to, to deal with uh, or cope with the difficulties of, uh, of uh, uh, defining the, uh, the, the exact uh, uh, term or the point or moment of, uh, of death or so, which can be very relevant in, in bioethics uh, uh, only partly because of uh, the dead donor rule or the uh, very possibilities of uh, different possibilities of uh, transplanting uh, uh, organs uh, to another uh, other body or another organism. And um, today, I think that this uh, uh, earlier wide consensus can be questioned again, it is very controversial again, due to uh, certain uh, anomalous uh, uh, cases. For example, the famous Jackie McMath's case uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was between uh, 2013 and uh, 18. Uh, this uh, cost some uh, 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 questions about um, this widely accepted uh, conception of uh, uh, human death. That is defined biologically as the irreversible loss of the functioning of the organism as a whole, again, which typically occurs after the loss of cardiorespiratory function. However, in 1968, the Harvard committee proposed that death could also be defined neurologically as the irreversible loss of a brain function. Brain death has been considered to be equivalent to cardiorespiratory arrest on the basis of the belief that the brain is required to maintain functioning of the organism as a whole and that without the brain, cardiorespiratory arrest and biological death are both rapid and certain. 
But there, over the past 20 years, however, this uh, equivalence has been shown to be false on the basis of numerous cases of patients correctly diagnosed. This is a, a, a medical paper, a med sorry, a medical journal uh, called Pediatrics. Yeah, of course, probably uh, many many bioethicists or, or uh, medical professionals uh, wouldn't agree with the, with this uh, uh, this conclusive um, this, this conclusion. Okay, this is about the uh, beginning of uh, uh, the human life uh, with uh, uh, some similar considerations and of course with uh, some uh, differences alike. Um, um, right, my starting point will be this, uh, this paper, uh, which was published in 2003, uh, written by Barry Smith and uh, Barry Brogorg, uh, called 16 Days. 16 Days refer to uh, this alleged uh, beginning of the human life as an organism. And this will be a very provocative and very unusual approach to this question. But the plan of these authors was to take uh, the biological, uh, biological knowledge and the biological terminology uh, very seriously and to try to define the beginning of human uh, life, which can be, uh, can be uh, relevant in uh, certain bioethical problems, uh, such as uh, the, med, uh, the moral acceptability of uh, abortion. Um, they uh, list uh, some um, basic characteristics of organism, the change that is a uh, numerically one, expand, extended in space, external boundary, there's an extended boundary uh, of the organism, this can be an important uh, thing, it's connected, uh, its parts are not separated from each other by spatial gaps, independence, and uh, uh, their definition will be this one in, in red, unified, an organism uh, should be a unified causal system that is relatively isolated from its surroundings. And some, this definition requires some more criteria. That is the seventh, external boundary, again, which is continuous. And eight, uh, certain spectrum of these allowed values uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, to, to exist. And covering this membrane, so there's a shield to protect. And the last one is that there are our mechanisms able to maintain functioning and reconstituting or replacing its coverage. So this can be a pretty good starting point to define uh, organism uh, from a biological uh, point of view. Their question was that how can we uh, to determine the beginning, the, that point of the beginning of human life, which can be relevant. And their answer is that it is the 16th day by and large, that is the gastrulation. The gastrulation, uh, on uh, their view, uh, uh, bring a very, um, very substantial step. And the point is that prior to gastrulation, the foster can split to grow into multiple babies, monozygotic uh, twining. But after this period, uh, it is not possible. So the numerical uh, uh, identity uh, is a crucial point uh, here. Uh, in this uh, conception. I want to turn to another uh, conception, which is actually uh, uh, was uh, answer to this assumption or this hypothesis uh, from Ersline Kingma, who was notably to gain a large, relatively large amount of money for this uh, 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 research program called Better Understanding of the Metaphysics of Pregnancy, 1.2 million euro for this uh, research. And there are already very good and promising uh, 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 papers uh, on this uh, conception. And now uh, she is, uh, uh, she's got appointed uh, as a uh, chair in the philosophy and medicine faculty in uh, King's uh, 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 College, in London. And, um, some papers in the nine months. Uh, 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 her answer to this 16 day uh, paper will be that no, no, it uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a failed approach. And the much better answer to the question of the beginning of the human life will be the nine months, that is the birth uh, itself. Um, birth, because uh, birth, and this will be the point here. Another paper from the mind, a very 
prestigious philosophy journal from 2019. Were you a part of your mother? So this can be a telling uh, about uh, uh, the nature of this approach. So um, she uh, distinguished between two uh, 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 conception. The one is the containment view. The other is the part to view. That is, uh, it about it, this is about the relationship between the uh, modern organism and the fetus. The foster, the fetus, as a tenant, for example, in the case of the containment view, that there is an organism of the mother and there is another organism, is the developing human uh, uh, being, uh, uh, the embryo and later the fetus, that is the foster. This term covers uh, every developmental uh, stages. The maternal organism serves as a niche for the developing uh, uh, foster. While the parthood, who, parthood view, which is advocated by uh, King Ma, uh, says that um, in the meteorological way, um, so this is a, in some sense a metaphysical answer to the question in a similar uh, way in that Giselin and Haas thesis was a metaphysical solution to the species problem, that this was a meteorological uh, thing that is uh, about changing the category. This is about the part whole relationship in this case. Uh, that is, uh, her answer is that uh, we should the fetus as part of the mother. So the mother and the maternal organism um, consist of, consists in uh, one uh, one organism and not two different organisms uh, in certain relations. The fetal container model emphasizes the physical resemblance and continuity between human and babies, presenting them as already separate individuals, while at the same time de emphasizing the fetus location within and connection to the uh, gestator. Images of human pregnancy, again, there is a, say, the social uh, or cultural representation of this, uh, uh, this situation. They emphasize fade out or omit to, altogether the gestator, the placenta, and the umbilical cord playing a um, central uh, role in the development, even after the gastrulation. The future body view concentrates on the uh, the baby itself after the gastrulation, but there are other developmental say, sources such as the placenta or the chorionic, uh, uh, chorionic uh, content uh, in general. And this was the point that um, these are metaphysical considerations and uh, based on some, uh, some scientific insights. At the same time, it can be clear how uh, these, uh, these considerations can be relevant in, in bioethical, very important bioethical uh, uh, problems. In relation to these problems, even though these authors try to keep distance from drawing conclusive, uh, conclusive answers or the lessons uh, from these uh, biological, uh, biological um, say theories or, or uh, conceptual analysis. <laughs>